Welcome back to The Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Tyler Page, CEO of Cypher Mining. We talk about Cypher's capital strategy, purchasing ASICs, and growing its operational footprint across Texas. Tyler, welcome to The Mining Podcast. Thank you so much for your time today. Really excited for this conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me, Will. It's great to be here. Yeah, you guys uh, have been growing pretty consistently, and there's a few public mining companies uh, that have been doing so during this bear market. And I think a lot of miners out there look at you and be like, how they do it in the first place, and where are they getting their capital, like what's their strategy, and they're trying to learn. Uh, and so that's why I like having guys like yourselves, CleanSpark, Riot, others who are just like building during this bear market on the podcast that help our audience out who are hopefully building their own mining operations. And that's sort of uh, where we're going to get to during the conversation. But to start, I do think a lot of miners might just be interested in getting a profile on you uh, because like you said, before we start recording, you guys were pretty quiet in 2022. You've been publicly listed for a while now uh, in terms of mining stocks. 2021, I think is when you guys IPO'd. So out there, but we need a little bit more information on Cypher mining itself. So I'll hand it over to you, just like the bare basics, 60 second elevator pitch, so to speak. Sure. Um, yeah. So we went public in 2021 and I think, you know, where did we get our money and things like that? Like you mentioned, it, it, it comes down to our philosophy and, and probably most miners that are successful, you know, over the long term, uh, come down to the same approach, which is thinking about managing the cycle. And that's the cycle of, of Bitcoin, of, of mining rigs, of capital, et cetera. And so, What's different about us is that we went public as a greenfield company. Um, we had a series of contracts arranged for very favorable power setups. Um, and we had we, we originally were set up uh, within the Bitfury group, which is a longtime miner. Uh, and I joined Bitfury to help consult with them about how to grow this U.S. business. And we looked at some different ways to do it. And ultimately, the decision was made to make it a completely independent standalone business. And at the time, this was late 2020, early 2021, the capital markets were, were pretty enthusiastic and excited about crypto. You, you might remember Bitcoin climbed a lot that Christmas break and everyone was like, oh my God, it's at 27,000 and now it's at 40,000. And, and suddenly um, there was a lot of enthusiasm. And so, you know, timing the cycle in, in this business, it's very capital intensive and, and timing the capital cycle is, is, is a big part of managing the business well. So we decided to, to completely make an independent new entity called Cypher Mining, uh, and we took it public in 2021. And in that go public process, we raised roughly $400 million of equity capital. And our anchor investors were Morgan Stanley and Fidelity. So we had some big names in there. Um, and, and look, Part of that, I'd like to think we were smart. And part of that, it was very lucky, right? The timing was good. I think, you know, my own background, I, I had a, a long time traditional finance background, but then also I was at Stone Ridge and a, and a day one employee at NYDIG. And so I had been working professionally in Bitcoin for a couple of years. And so at an enthusiastic time when traditional investors were looking for ways to get exposed, um, you, you know, I think we, we set up a company that felt like an easy bridge between traditional finance but with lots of experience and, and knowledge in, in the mining space. And so we were very lucky. We were very successful in that capital raise. But what's different about us is we, we set out to build a large scale miner from like a blank slate. I think that's really what's different about us. And, and that comes through in our, in our advantages, candidly, is that it's much easier. I think most mining companies started with like two friends and they started with six rigs in their garage and then they found some investors and, and built out a megawatt and they sort of linearly scaled. And, and that's awesome. Um, but in some ways, if you start from a blank slate and say, let's design a, a company that leverages technology and tries to squeeze out inefficiencies, like how would you design a, a mega a Bitcoin miner from scratch? And again, now we've got some of these companies. At the time, that was not the case. It really wasn't that long ago. But raising $400 million, I think was like, more capital than any miner had raised by several multiples at the time. And so at any rate, um, we went public in the fall of 2021. Uh, 
literally with a, a pile of, of proceeds to use and, and a dream uh, and, you know, sort of four patches of dirt. Uh, and, uh, you know, flash forward about a year and a half, we now have four operating data centers. We just put out our January production report, currently hashing uh, 4.3 exahash per second of self-mining capacity, and that's growing to six uh, in the first quarter of this year. And so, you know, part of the reason people haven't heard of us is we, we really had our heads down a lot in 2022 saying everyone at Bitcoin mining's got grandiose plans. Let's not just be another one of those. Let, let's make sure we're executing on that. And now we're, we're starting to see the fruits of, of all that labor. So that, that's where we are today. I tried to make it 60 seconds. I went a little long. No, that was, that was perfect. I want to go back to the capital raise part. And I think you made a really great distinction there that a lot of people have to progress literally. A lot of people who are listening to this podcast, they had to go through those iterations, right? You start with one miner, maybe it's mining outside your house, and then you start building up and you have dreams and you scale. And uh, I like to get miners of every type and size on here because everyone comes from a different position. And you guys are, certainly have a uh, distinction there. In terms of the capital and how you're looking at now, I would assume that there's like a little more pressure, right? Like you, you've had these high profile bankers who partner with you guys at the time capital markets were really good there, maybe even frothy. And now two years later, three years later, people are looking around. They're like, oh, I'm not so sure I want to invest in, in Bitcoin right now. But of course, it's locked into what you guys have built and you guys have executed on top of that. That being said, curious about the relationships and the continued relationships with these uh, equity groups that you've, you've worked with. Sure. So, I mean, look, we're, we're listed on NASDAQ in a public company. So, so people can, you know, we, we love long-term shareholders, but of course there's, you know, last year was a wild ride in the capital markets for everyone, not just Bitcoin miners. Right. So, you know, we have some turnover, we have some long-term shareholders as well with, with pretty chunky, uh, shareholdings. Um, you know, again, the great benefit for us is that starting with, um, that large pool of equity capital, we haven't had to run out and do a giant financing to plug a hole. And we haven't had to do incremental dilution along the way, like, hey, sorry, but we need some more capital. Um, and, and so that's been a great benefit of ours. Again, somewhat um, planned and, and somewhat lucky. Um, so, so our relationships are good. I mean, obviously our shares went down with everyone else in the sector last year. It was very painful to watch. I think the benefit of having raised, uh, you know, at a good time in the cycle, we had the capital to kind of withstand that. The employees we've hired, uh, we, we've hired every one of them with a long-term time horizon. Thinking about that cycle, what we really like, what I really like about Bitcoin mining is thinking about how it can be profitable over the, the medium and long-term. Um, sure, you can day trade it and whatever, Bitcoin spikes, and these stocks often act like levered vehicles. I think what's interesting to us, and especially building something at scale, we think there are some opportunities over the longer term where a company like that has a lot of advantages. And so we've been, you know, listen, we felt the pain of the markets last year. But luckily, we didn't have to go into them to raise capital. So we, we you know, lots of folks have had to go through rougher uh, patches. It's been a rough six months for us, but um, not like a lot of my friends at the other shops. Yeah, I actually want to dig into that. I was, I was planning on getting this question later in the podcast, but maybe I'll flip it on its head and just ask it now. How are you guys managing this this position, right? And right now, the, the latest I've seen is that you guys have been buying ASICs on the cheap. It must have taken a lot of patience to be able to get there where you were uh, with withholding from the gratification of purchasing new shiny machines and new shiny facilities and being able to purchase now at, uh, at the bottom. So... Give me a little bit of the inside scoop on how you guys manage your treasury from 2021 until present. Sure. So I think, let me break that into two pieces because there's sort of the question of what everyone's talking about with treasury management today with their stash of Bitcoin. And we now have a, a, a very thoughtful process around that. But looking back historically, we had a treasury of USD to manage. Um, and and the, the most challenging part there really was having the discipline to time that cycle. So flashback, it's late August, 2021. We've successfully run the, the gauntlet. We've gone public. We now have close to $400 million to spend on these data centers. We're ramping up. We need to secure the ASICs because again, we didn't have the capital in our hands yet until we finished the go public transaction. Now, what we ended up doing was we negotiated a series of kind of distant futures purchases because we knew we, didn't, we weren't going to have a data center for a while, right? It, it took a while. 
you know, what's crazy about last year is like everyone remembers the trauma of the last six months of the year. But for miners, the first six months were like a different kind of trauma where supply chains were tough. You couldn't get transformers. Things were delayed, et cetera. Um, the, the sort of benefit of starting with patches of dirt and mesquite and scrub grass was that we knew we couldn't put miners to use like next month or in the spot market. So, you know, we ended up trying to time our, our delivery schedules. And by doing that, we negotiated very favorable terms with, with MicroBT and Bitmain. Um, so that was a big part of, of managing the cycle and preserving capital that, um, and, and may have been the hardest part. We got a lot of pressure to like, well, what if you went and did a small hosting deal and bought some rigs at $90 a terahash right now so you can show progress? Um, and look, it was very tempting because I think people looked at us a little bit like you're a greenfield company, like you don't even have, you're not even mining yet. Um, but, you know, thankfully we, we resisted that urge. So the biggest part, and I think if you look across our entire fleet, we paid roughly thirty dollars a terahash for uh, an almost sixty thousand rig fleet, um, and that's through the whole market where the prices were much higher than that. Most of that was based on those futures orders. Then, subsequent to that, you mentioned you know um, making some opportunistic deals, really opportunistically timing the cycle. We did make some purchases in the fall. Um, we purchased seventy two hundred rigs uh, from Bitmain. I'm sure many listeners on the program will know. They have um, these kind of loyalty programs where you can earn coupons if you make payments on time. We made our, our payments on time to, to Bitmain, so we had accumulated a lot of those and, and we put them to very good work. We had some accumulated credits and coupons. And so net of, of spending that, we got an extremely low single digit per terahash um, cost across those 7,200 rigs. So, you know, look, the, those rigs would have cost, you know, a, a ridiculous amount, you know, $70 million or whatever a year before. So a big part of, of thinking about it with a long-term time horizon is you've got to have that discipline when everything's so hot and Bitcoin's ripping and your stock's going up with Bitcoin every day to take a deep breath and be disciplined about ROI calculations and how long is it going to take to for us to earn this money back, et cetera. I, I want to press in a lot more on the, the bit about like stock prices and pressure to put units online because I think that's a really interesting thing that happened with public companies and uh, they had all these hash rate predictions, hash rate guidance, and they're oftentimes multiples higher than they should have been. Uh, and that was misleading at best in many cases. What was your guys' sort of thought during this whole cycle where people are pressuring you guys to put units online? You're choosing not to. You're choosing to wait for another day. Uh, I'm sure that was pretty hard when you're looking at some people calling for 100k Bitcoin prices. It, it Look, it, it was. I think in some ways, again, um, sometimes it's better to be more lucky than good. I, I think we're both. Um, but, you know, dealing with the supply chains and being ready to have a, a plug ready for a miner probably ramps up that pressure quite a bit. Um, you know, when we structure our power contracts, we try to set up contracts so that we don't have take or pay obligations until we're ready to go. Meaning, you know, sometimes one of the things that's hard about signing a long-term PPA is, you hit a point where whether you're ready or not, you have to start paying for the power. You know, we, we try to minimize that risk. So that dialed down the pressure that, you know, just trying to manage the supply chain, get everything online, it was easier to push back. I, I'd say in in every in the industry's defense um, for, for projecting, you know, big builds of hash rate, there, there was also a time when like the capital markets were just open. People were doing ASIC loans right and left. And so it wasn't unrealistic if you had um, a setup at a data center to be built and you know how long it takes to build a, a data center to say, oh, we'll, we'll forecast what the hash rate looks like from that data center because we'll, we'll go get a loan from one of the handfuls of lenders that are throwing out ASIC loans. So, you know, I don't think people were, I, I think that also, and, and it became such a growth mindset around the stocks. One of the things that frustrated us is we've always stressed that thinking about cycle management, we've set up what, what, what I think are the best unit economics of at least the public miners. Um, we, we pay 2.7 cents per kilowatt hour for power. Um, as you and everyone in this space knows, that that's like the main overwhelming majority of OPEX. And so I've been beating this drum on, you know, the thing is thinking about unit economics. And this is a company that produces Bitcoins for lower than the market price. Like that's ultimately why you'd invest in it. But the truth is in 2021, with Bitcoin just ripping and people making $100,000 per coin predictions, 
it just became very growth metric oriented. So it was like, listen, it doesn't matter what you pay. And, and that's right. If Bitcoin rips to $100,000 next month, all that matters is how quickly you can get an ASIC and plug it in for any price, right? Because like the margin's so high. Um, you know, but we sort of stuck to our knitting. I mean, we, we went public with a story of this cycle management and, and cost discipline. And, you know, we, we managed to, to get to a point where the market really punished everyone. And, and that's what, frankly, the only thing that got us through. You know, I mean, it was a real tough market for the end of last year. One last question on, on that subject with ASICs. What's the relationship with BitNay and MicroBT if you're projecting things out, right? It's normally people have a distribution relationship with MicroBT or BitMain and they, they go through that sort of backside or they have a direct relationship with BitMain and they're, they're purchasing future orders, but normally it's bid up quite a bit. And as we've seen with a few miners, they've either defaulted on those future orders or they had to figure out how to scramble and get cash to fulfill those orders or they sold those orders off. I'm curious to get your thoughts on like how you guys at least handled those relationships. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to say we have a great relationship with both of those companies. Um, we, you know, it, it helps when you spend, you know, hundred plus million dollars on rigs from both of them. Obviously, you, you get a little bit of extra credit for that, um, and and making payments, um, you know, on time uh, in general. Um, you know, that said, I think both of those companies, you know, sort of putting myself in their shoes, when we got into last summer. At a certain point, if every one of your clients is facing a problem with what you've agreed to do in the future, you know, from their position, I don't think it's prudent to like shove everyone over the edge. And so ultimately what happened is it was such a bad market. It's not like one company got upside down, like everyone was in a tough spot. So we made our payments. We managed to stay in front of them. We did short close our contract with MicroBT. Um, you know, we paid for all the rigs we we wanted. Um, I, I'd like to think, I'll, I'll put some words in their mouth, but I, I think we have a really good relationship. I feel like I'm on the chat apps multiple times a week with both of those companies. I think they know we're, we're excited for our next round of purchases from them. And, and I'd like to think they're playing the long game and they think highly of us. So happy to say great relationship with, with both of those shops. Do you have a preference for uh, which type of machine at this point? Or no, I mean, I think look, they both they both make great machines. I think they both have strengths and weaknesses. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to pick a favorite child. You know, that was a, that was a good answer. Blake, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that was a very good answer. Uh, but let's let's move over to the facility talk since you already uh, moved us over that way. You guys pay a really low energy price, and and that's a fantastic deal, especially during a uh, bull market where it's so hard to find allocations for energy, find allocations for land. Walk me through the four sites that you guys currently own and operate and tell me about like the future plans for them. Sure, so um, I'll, I'll break them into sort of two buckets, but there's four sites. The first bucket, um, we have a series of sites that are joint ventures with our energy provider. And so we, we have a very good partner at our sites, which are called Albor's Bear and Chief, A, B, and C, kind of easy to remember, um, where we're, 51, 49, you know, call it 50, 50 joint venture partners with the provider. We build and operate the data center. Um, we get a very favorable uh, cost on the power effectively for letting them have half that capacity. And we each throw in half the capital to operate it. I think they're a very forward thinking provider, obviously. Um, so through the nature of that structured partnership, we could get extremely low um, prices. The first site, Outwars, is Pretty cool. A lot of engineering challenges around it. It's um, directly connected to a wind farm and not connected to the grid. And so what's truly unique about that is like if the wind's not blowing, our rigs aren't hashing. And so I, I, I think the engineering challenges, we, we've put our data science team through a lot. We actually built a, a model that can predict the wind a few minutes ahead at 165 different turbines around this wind farm so that we can begin the process of powering down or powering up the data center. Now, what the implications of that are that, um, you know, we expect the uptime there in, in large sample size to only be about 75%. But that's a really good thing there because the power price is so low and because it's directly connected to a wind farm, um, there's a much lower capex. We don't have a, a high voltage, medium voltage substation there that's required. So the investment in the data center itself has less investment to recoup, uh, and uh, the power is extremely cheap. But it, it's been a, a really cool um, 
engineering sort of solution we, we've come up with, and, it, and it's cool that it's just wind powered. Um, the the second and third sites uh, that we call Baron Chief are front of the meter sites in West Texas, um, where we've got a, a location in the grid in Texas where traditionally you can get extremely cheap power because there's an overabundance of supply. Um, they're smaller; they're 10 megawatts each to start. And again, we only own half of that, so it's five at each site for us. Um, Outwards is a 40 megawatt site, and we own half of that. Um, and and so. A little bit of diversification here where we have a PPA at Alborz, Baron Chief, our, our front of the meter, but generally pay a very low floating price and they're a little smaller. So that's our first three data centers. The biggest chunk of our production and what's coming online very rapidly now and with each monthly update, we're getting these big jumps in hash rate, is our site at Odessa. Uh, at Odessa, we are behind the meter. We have a direct PPA with the energy provider. We're co-located with them. It's a 54 acre site, so it's massive. I mean, it takes 10, 15 minutes to drive around the, the site. Um, it's 207 megawatts, so it's 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 very sizable. And and again, um, our, our blended average price across PPAs is about 2.73 cents exactly. So it, it being the majority of our power is obviously pretty close to that price. Um, and that's a five year fixed price PPA. So um, th that's the last site. That site now has uh, we just energized uh, about 13,000 rigs there last month in the month of January. Uh, ultimately, that site will scale up through the end of the first quarter, and we still have a little capacity we could expand at there. Um, but as that comes online, it's 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 a really impressive site. And the other thing at that site is with the PPA, um, with our fixed price of power, we can, of course, participate in demand response and sell power back to the grid via our provider. So um, that provides some other you know nice benefits that I know guests on your show talk about quite a bit oh yeah we love that topic on on this show for sure uh curious about management of these poor sites right that's a lot of legwork that's a lot of management it's a lot of employees and then if you break it down even further to different like uh, energy grids that you guys are plugging into whether behind the meter or dealing with the wind that you guys have to calculate ppas tell me a little bit a little bit about that from like a team management perspective yeah, so getting back to where we started, thinking about the benefits of starting with a blank slate and saying, how do you design this efficiently? And and you can think about this like in a big um, legacy organization, right? You think about like the technology, it's so hard to update. I know like the the FAA had a problem last month and, you know, it comes out that, you know, the software's programmed in COBOL and they can't find any COBOL programmers. That's, it's, it's hard at legacy institutions to sort of stepwise upgrade and try to solve for all the historical legacy stuff there. One of the benefits of starting from scratch is saying, how do we, you know, blank slate, how do we make this really efficient? So the way we've done that is, is try to leverage technology. I mean, I'll highlight a, a couple of our, our key team members. Um, you know, Pat Kelly, who's our chief operating officer, Brian Keller, who's our chief technology officer, have backgrounds in, in finance, but FinTech and have built FinTech operating environments. And so thinking about it from that perspective, we leverage quite a bit of technology. We have a very low head count for as much size as we have. The company, I think we have our 26th employee starting next week. Um, now, we do have some contractors, so it's a bit of, of maximizing the use of technology to be efficient. And then for things that um, are best handled more locally, we will often outsource things like, you know, if we need a local security, um, you know, we have a ticketing system we've got where uh, uh, you know, a, a, a contractor might be on repairs and fixing fan blades, you know, and report to uh, our head of data centers or our head of machines, et cetera. So it, it's all about kind of thoughtful hierarchy and, and how we manage that. I'll mention, you know, I think we've got 26 people, as I mentioned, counting some of the starting next week. They're really high quality people. Uh, we, we have four people that worked on Google data centers. You know, like our chief construction officer, our chief construction officer used to build Google's data centers. Our our head of data centers used to operate them. So they, you know, they've got a lot of experience. Again, starting from um, that large scale, like how do we do this top down from a planning perspective? Yeah, just like sort of a side comment here, less so than a question. It's, it's interesting how many Bitcoin mining teams choose to keep things tight and small in terms of uh, the headcount. And then they often use contractors on a local level. And then there's the opposite model, or I'd say like Riot is probably that, where they have, I think, 500 employees. And they seem to just 
bring everybody into the fold and don't use as many contractors. Um, that's my understanding of it as least, at least. And I think that kind of goes back into like the Bitcoin mining coming to the U S post China. There's a lot of that blue collar work ethic, uh, integrating into Bitcoin mining right now, bringing jobs into the U S economy. And it's, it's always interesting to see sort of like that divide between the two things. I don't really see any like sort of medium sized companies so far. Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately you probably end up with about the same number of people working on the site. So I view it as, you know, there's just as many people employed. It's not like we figured out a way to have our fans not break in the rigs or something like that. And it's not like, you know, we don't have local people working on it. It's just that from a corporate management perspective, there are certain things that are, um, you know, more effective to build in-house and manage yourself and certain things where in the same way, like we outsource our payroll, right? Like we don't have a mm -hmm. payroll department with four people sitting in it, walking checks around to everyone, because in the modern world, there's all kinds of services that have been optimized to outsource that. I view it the same way. It's not that there's not people doing it. It's that we've got like sort of specific experts that are dedicated to that. And it makes it a little bit easier from a corporate management perspective, managing our costs, being flexible, et cetera. Definitely. So I can only ask a few forward-looking statements since you guys are publicly listed, but I am interested in what's coming on the horizon for you guys. My understanding is NFQ1, you guys are planning to have over 6x the hash online. Tell me tell me a little bit about that, where the future plans in the next few months as, as much as you can say. Sure. So, um, you know, as of sort of this morning, we have 4.3 operating. You know, as I mentioned, we just put out our January re production report. We're steadily plugging in rigs, and, and basically we've already paid for 6 exahash of rigs, so the remaining 1.7-ish left, we anticipate will all be plugged in and installed at Odessa between now and the end of the first quarter. Beyond that, you know, it's interesting. In some ways, the pendulum swung so far, right? Like, it was all a growth story, and it swung to this kind of, like, cash and survival story for the last few months because the, the market's been so ugly. Ultimately, you know, this still has to be a growth story. You have to be ready for that. So I think beyond our six exa hash that we've already acquired and we expect to have installed by the end of the first quarter, just at Odessa, we anticipate having the infrastructure ready uh, with slots ready for about one exa hash of new rigs. If you assume we bought S19 generation, M30S++ generation, it could be more if you bought the next gen. But the lowest hanging fruit for us is we've got an incredible power price sitting there waiting for rigs. So we could be opportunistic. We can buy in the secondary market. We could, you know, if rigs stay cheap, we can buy directly. I think like everyone else, we've tried to prudently manage our growth. I don't want to get overextended in a tough market. If, you know, Bitcoin looks great right now, uh, at least the path I should say looks great. If it turns around tomorrow and goes to $15,000, we, we don't ever want to be overextended. So we have super low hanging fruit right there to expand just at Odessa when we can be opportunistic. Beyond that, um, I mentioned our Bear and Chief sites. They actually have interconnection for much larger data centers, and we've done the planning that envisions with them, I think the interconnection is 135 megawatts at both. We're not gonna do that all at once, but we have ready to go sort of staged growth that I hope we'll get to later this year. Um, no, no promises, we've sort of mapped it out and it's there. If the market's ripping, it's, it's ready to go. Um, so. We've got a lot of options on growth without a lot of requirements or, or sort of forced things we have to pay for. So I think we have the best of both worlds. I think, you know, right now we're, we're laser focused on finishing the build out. We've had a couple months of tremendous growth. Our ops team needs a vacation, frankly, but they're going to go a couple more months here and make sure we get the six exa hash up and running. Uh, and then we'll think about prudent growth for the remaining three quarters of the year. Love it. Okay, last question for you. You probably know which one's coming up, future expectations for hash rate as of the end of this coming year. So December 31st, 2023, what do you think we're at in terms of hash rate? So well, let me start with, it's a great question, right? I, I think everyone ponders this. I think it's uniquely difficult now because I think if you look at the big sample historically, I guess I should give the caveat. Like predicting Bitcoin prices, something could happen tomorrow that could wildly change any of these predictions. And I can almost guarantee by the time the pod goes up, something will sound stupid, right? But my my best guess right now, looking at things, I think, you know, traditionally, ha network hash rate follows Bitcoin price with a lag, right? Which makes sense. It becomes more profitable. 
people invest, but it takes a while to build facilities or get rigs or whatever. And so, you know, maybe with like a six month lag in a slightly more normal market, that's what you'd expect. The really weird wild card here is there's some amount of rigs just sitting around that people didn't pick up that were manufactured and are sitting on the sidelines. And so it feels like we could have a big run to me to digest those rigs. And it wouldn't surprise me to, if we saw a fast run to 325 soon, if, if Bitcoin prices keep on this path that we've had the last couple of days and keep going, um, folks may scramble to buy up that old inventory. But then what's interesting, and I, the, you know, the question that's hard to answer is sort of what happens next? There haven't been a ton of these orders for the next gen equipment because people haven't had the money or the risk appetite. Um, so how quickly people re react, you know, I, I could see us have a quick run and then a plateau and then maybe back to more of a steady growth. The other thing you got to keep in mind is the halving is on the horizon. Right now, the problem I see with a lot of miners is they just, their cost of operations is too much. They pay too much for power. It, there's sort of a, a ticking time bomb on like needing Bitcoin prices to go higher. So a lot's going to depend on that, right? If you're getting into the end of the year and Bitcoin's kind of whatever up a little bit, folks are only going to be a couple months out from the habit. I don't think they're going to run out and buy tons of rigs. Long-winded way to answer your question. I think it probably, you know, starts picking up. I'm, you know, moderately bullish on Bitcoin right now. The direction of macro stuff looks healthy. Um, and if that happens, I think we'll go up. So by, I think 325 could happen pretty quick if that continues. Year end, I'll say 350. But again, I'm sure that's going to sound stupid the next time we talk. No, 350 is where a lot of people are landing. I think that's a, a pretty fair measurement. I had somebody last year at this time say 350 for the end of 2022. So I think that person might look a little silly, but uh, I think that's a pretty fair prediction right now. Tyler, thank you so much for your time. Uh, and for telling us about cipher mining best of luck to you and the team and again thank you for your time today will thank you so much for having me love the pod thanks